concert as artistic director, but because he is a violinist who has played all of the pieces on this program as a violinist, and I thought he would have wonderful insight into the music. The beauty of what we're going to do now is that unlike in the program notes, we can actually demonstrate to you things to listen for. And we are going to have a handful of examples. Obviously, we can't cover four works in any kind of detail, but I'm hoping we can give you a little bit of a taste of each one of them. Uh, before we do that, I would actually like to ask Gary to talk a little bit about the overarching theme of the season, which is a season of reflection, and what that means in terms of the full season and what it means in terms of this particular concert. When I was putting the season together, I really felt like we needed to have a unifying theme so that you, our audience, basically go on the journey of all of the concerts. So each one of the concerts here are going to have some kind of a reflective theme. I mean, it's essentially, if we look at this afternoon's concert, the Barbara Adagio, of course, speaks for itself. Everyone knows of its mystical quality. But for example, in the Beethoven, the Razumovsky, Opus 59, number two, you've got a slow movement where Beethoven says, rising to the heavens. And so m many of the pieces here, and I would say many of the pieces in all of our programs, really have a mystical, a thoughtful quality that really will make you think about what this music means to you individually, and that's what it's supposed to do. It's not supposed to say, well, here's the right way of thinking about it, here's the right way of listening to it. It's personal to each and every person. If you look at your program page, you'll see that this particular concert is titled The Colors of Impressionism, Passion, and Sensibility. And Gary, I wonder if you could elucidate that a little bit. Well, of course, we start with the Miro String Quartet. The Miro String Quartet is named after the great artists, and they paint, artists paint with paints, and we paint with music. And so the Miro String Quartet playing the Ravel String Quartet, the master colorist. Now, Ravel is very interesting, at least to me, because as a string player, somebody who s spends a lot of time playing in the orchestra as well, you see that the way Ravel kind of approaches string playing is with color mostly. He doesn't give the violins, the cellos, the basses that much melody per se. In, in fact, he, he gives most of it to the woodwinds, oftentimes to piano, and to the percussion. But what we have here is a master colorist, and he wrote this work in early 20th century. Um, one of the things that I actually really love is he, Ravel, participated in one of the very first recordings of the Ravel um, String Quartet, and he insisted on being through every session, telling the International String Quartet pretty much how he was going to phrase it and how this was going to work. We are going to hear some examples from Ravel in a little bit, but first I want to get through the rest of this subtitle. What about passion and sensibility? Well, as my old teacher at Juilliard, Miss DeLay, said, Beethoven was not a furious composer. He was a passionate composer. And no better example than Opus 59, number two. The sensibility, I, I think, in many ways, you've got the sensibility of Barbara here, reflective of everything we're doing, kind of the glue that holds this program together. And sensibility in the Jane Austen sense, I think we're also looking at people who think about their feelings and people who have both an intellectual and the idea of the heart participating in something that appeals to us from multiple aspects. We would like to start with a little bit of a sampling of the Schubert String Quartet, number 12 in C minor, D703. The D stands for Otto Erich Deutsch, the guy who cataloged Schubert's works, much as Kirchhoff cataloged the Mozart works. So you get the K with Kirchhoff, uh, uh, with Mozart, and you get the D with Schubert. This particular work is singular on a number of levels because it is one of many works that Schubert left unfinished, and yet, it is one of those works that has secured a really good place in the repertoire. Virtually every string quartet plays this quartet, even though it's one movement. I wonder, Gary, as a string player, can you tell us why string players are drawn to this work? Obviously, it's passionate. It's incredibly passionate, but there's a structural difference, an inherent structural difference to this work that is different from many of other Schubert's work. For example, many of you, I'm sure, know the Unfinished Symphony, the opening of it is very similar in texture to what you're about to hear. However, what you're about to hear, the strings, when they open, it is in fact melodic. Whereas in most Schubert works, especially in, when you look at leader, when the piano has to quote unquote accompany, it is harmonic, it is textural, it's setting up something else. Why don't we hear a little bit of the opening? 
Yes, and I also would like to draw your attention, Gary talked about structural integrity and tightness. The basic principle in musical organization is contrast. And in the space of a mere 40 seconds, Schubert takes us from this passionate first theme to a second theme that is incredibly lyrical. He starts out with something that is nervous and agitated and very chromatic. Then his second theme is just That sounds like Schubert, the song composer, but it's that chromatic thing. The way he transforms it from something nervous and introductory at the very beginning to something that becomes the first theme is absolutely miraculous. May we have example one, please? This is the opening of the Schubert Quartet Satz. So in the space of just a few seconds, he takes us from that intense agitation, that passion of the beginning, and takes us automatically to a song melody that is a complete change of pace. And from this, he spins out this entire very tightly constructed sonata form movement. In your program notes, you will read that he wrote an andante. There's about 40 bars of it. And he left it unfinished. And I have a very quick snippet of a recording of the very end of that andante, and you'll hear what happens when a composer leaves something just hanging and unfinished. Example two, please. So you hear he had written that much of the first violin part. He'd stopped filling in the lower parts. And don't we wish that he had finished the full quartet? <laughs> but we're going to start our program with that, with that one movement, which is just magnificent. Moving to the Ravel, it's a wonderfully expressive piece. It's a piece that we call cyclic because there are thematic ideas at the very beginning that recur later on, somewhat transformed. But he uses this as a unifying device. Let's listening to, listen to the opening of the first movement of the Ravel. This is example three, please. Hear that this work is firmly rooted in F major, and he starts out with this motive. That's the one that's going to come back again and again in various guises throughout the balance of the quartet. The next example that we have is from the Assez Vif Très Rythmé, which means very lively, extremely rhythmic. It starts out with pizzicato, and then you'll hear a little bit of arco, which means one of the players starts using a bow, but then you'll hear the combination of the pizzicato and the arco. It's one of the most original movements in the entire string quartet le literature. May we hear track four, please?
remarkable things about this movement is Ravel's use of something that's called cross rhythms. There is a Greek word that musicians have adopted called hemiola. It basically means the superimposition of three beats against two or two against three. Composers have different ways of doing this. Brahms was very uh, fond of this device and if the easiest way to explain it is Leonard Bernstein's America from West Side Story, which I want to live in America. I want to live in America. <laughs> you, it's it's fortunately you do. I'm sorry. Yes. We're both New Yorkers. Well, be, but be, be aware of that, particularly in the scherzo. And uh, another rhythmic device that Ravel uses that's quite extraordinary in the finale of this quartet is the unusual meter of five eighth notes per measure. So it's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And it's, it's obviously quite ir irregular, but it adds to the intensity of what's going on. What does this mean for the string players? Well, oftentimes, from a straight rehearsal standpoint of view, you have to decide whether you're going to play one, two, one, two, three, or one, two, three, one, two. And of oftentimes, you do have to organize it because everybody's got to play it together. In this case, it's actually very interesting because Ravel does mark. He doesn't want you to divide it, subdivide it, two or three, or three of two. He wants one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So you get almost a spinning wheel type of a feel to the, to the stroke. And when you listen and watch the quartet, I think you'll see that there's, there's a certain way to organize the beginnings of the bars where there's a fluidity to the middle and the end of the bar. There is an example that we have that is from the finale to the Ravel. It starts about 15 seconds in because it's sort of a take no prisoners opening. He really seizes your attention. If you thought you were nodding out because the slow movement was so beautiful, you're definitely going to be awake when they start the finale. And uh, you can hear the 5-8 rhythm, but you also, if you listen really carefully, hear a little bit of that theme that I plunked out at the piano. May we have example five, please? Did you hear at the violin entrance there, that reference to the opening theme from the first movement? It's very subtle, but there's things like that throughout the entire quartet, and that is what we mean when we use the term cyclic. There is another sort of a unifier to Beethoven's Razumovsky Quartet, the uh, Quartet Opus 59, number two, which is the anchor work on the second half of the program. It was one of three quartets commissioned by a very wealthy Russian nobleman who maintained a residence in Vienna. He was so rich, he had a residence string quartet. He was passionate about music. And when he gave Beethoven this commission, Beethoven hadn't written quartets in a very long time, not since his very early quartets, the six of Opus 18, which have made frequent appearances on this series in the past. But the Opus 59 quartets we have not heard. And uh, this one is particularly wonderful. What makes it special, Gary? Well, one of the things that makes it special to me is Count Razumovsky himself. You know, he was the Tsar's ambassador to Vienna. And besides being extremely wealthy and well-versed, he loved a young Beethoven. And what I often think about in this is Beethoven, we don't really realize, was a working composer. And so a few years back, he actually sent some violin sonatas to the Tsar because he wanted a job there. And he sent these scores to the Tsar, and the Tsar said, very nice, I don't care, stay in Vienna. So, <laughs> you know, this, this was kind of one of those things where I think he wanted to almost prove himself to the Russians, and he did a great thing here when he wrote these masterpieces. They're, they're full of innovation. In fact, um, a lot of the critics said, wow, this is very interesting, but I don't know if our ears are ready for it, whereas in the 21st century, they absolutely are. One of the points that I would like to make to you, it's in your program notes, but I want to be sure that you have it in your ears as well, is that for some reason when Beethoven wrote in the key of E, whether E major or E minor as his home tonality, he kept every movement in E. He did not move to a relative key or a nearby key. It is customary to change keys in movements, but he kept everything either in, in this case, E minor or E major. And that is the explanation in the third movement. You see it says allegretto maggiore minore. Those are just the Italian words for major and minor. 
and essentially it's the format of a scherzo and trio, it's just that he's taking it initially at a more relaxed tempo. What the Count asked him to do was to incorporate a Russian tune, and Beethoven actually wrote the words Tim Rus, Russian theme, in French, which was the language of publication. Uh, I guess the Germans and the Austrians had an inferiority complex about their own language until later in the 19th century. And he actually wrote this tune in. It is the maggiore section, which is essentially the B section, the trio section, if you will, of the quartet. He starts it in the viola and he moves it through all four instruments. Any of you who knows opera may recognize this tune because Mussorgsky used it in the opera Boris Gudunov in the coronation scene. And Gary, I believe Tchaikovsky used it also? Yes, it's called the Slava. Sometimes we actually forget that great composers, when they write refined works, they also like to use folk tunes as a contrast to some of their original melodies. So, as you heard, he uses it not exactly like a fugue subject, but he gives each of the four instruments a turn at it, starting with the viola, then giving it to the second fiddle, then giving it to the cello, and finally, in the high register, the first violin. This is the way composers use themes. They use them to change the harmonies, because you'll hear as it alternates, it shifts keys temporarily. They use it to change register. We'll hear it in a high register, a middle register, a low register. And then he'll play games with it and compose around it, kind of giving us what we call counter melodies in order to enrich the texture and keep our interest there as listeners. And the beautiful part of the Miro Quartet is that they're not playing it at the piano, reading clefs that they don't know. They're playing it on their own instruments, and I heard them rehearsing, and they sound absolutely fabulous. So with that, we have taken you on a whirlwind tour through four movements of this monumental Beethoven Quartet, which is significantly longer than any of the Opus 18 quartets. And it sort of reflects the changes comparable in, say, Beethoven's first symphony from the Eroica Symphony, which when it was composed was the longest symphony ever written. These were the longest quartets that had been written, written up to this time, but Beethoven had a lot to say, and boy, did he say it brilliantly. Bravo. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the concert.